All right, so by now we should be pretty good at finding derivatives of functions. So for example, if I give you the function x square, then you should uh, be able to calculate right away that the derivative should be equal to 2x. This is just a simple application of the power rule. However, if I ask you the following question, so take the same function x square, but then I ask you to find a function capital F of x such that the derivative of that new function is equal to my original function, namely x squared. So this is kind of the inverse question. Instead of trying to find a derivative, now I ask you to find a function such that its derivative is equal to my original function. That's the inverse process. It's got a name. It's called antiderivative. So we say that the function capital F of x is an antiderivative of little f of x if the derivative of capital F of x is equal to my original function. So in the case that I had above, so if my little f of x is x squared, then if you think about it for a few minutes, you'll probably come up with the antiderivative being given by x cubed over 3, because the derivative of this function recovers x squared. But now what about if I choose capital F of x to be, say, x cubed over 3 plus 5? Well, if I take the derivative of that function, I'll still get x squared, because the derivative of a constant is 0. Right, so in fact, there is no unique answer here. There's a whole bunch of antiderivative. So I could write my general antiderivative in this case as being x cubed over 3 plus an arbitrary constant c, where c here stands for an arbitrary real number. It doesn't matter what this real number is. If I take the derivatives, this will go to 0, so I will always get x squared as my derivative here. Now it's standard notation to use c for this extra constant that we have to uh, add to find a general antiderivative of a function. All right, so I could do the same thing not just for x squared, but for any power functions, and I would get this table here. So the summary here is that for any function x to the power r, the general antiderivative will be 1 over r plus 1, x to the power r plus 1, plus an arbitrary constant. So indeed, by the power rule, the derivative of this function is just x to the r. Now there's a special case here. So if you think about it, so far, we haven't seen a single function such that its derivative is 1 over x. So this is true for any r not equal to minus 1. In this case, well, there is such a function, but we haven't seen it yet, so we will in the next few weeks. So we'll fill this gap later on. All right, you could also have a, a similar table for trig functions. So this is just the kind of inverse table to the table that we had for derivatives of trig functions. For example, if I want to find the antiderivative, uh, antiderivative of cosine, so in other words, I'm asking what function is such that its derivative gives you back a cosine? Well, that will be the sine function plus an arbitrary constant c. All right, there's a related concept, which is called indefinite integrals. So let me now define what this is. So if you are given an antiderivative capital F of x, so a function such that its derivative is f of x, then we write the indefinite integral of f of x dx is equal to capital F of x plus c, and we call this symbol here indefinite integral of the function f of x. So what this symbol means here is that we are finding the general antiderivative of f of x, which is why we add to add uh, this constant, this arbitrary constant here. So this is just the inverse symbol, if you wish, as the symbol ddx of f of x, which was uh, which meant finding the derivative of our function. This means finding the general antiderivative of the function. Now it's important that you're not confused, and you don't, do not confuse the symbol with the symbol for definite integrals. So this is different from what we saw in week two. We called uh, that definite integral. So in terms of symbol, so uh, the symbol for definite integral was the same sign, but it had a lower bound a and an upper bound b here. So they meant very different things. So definite integral is a number which calculated the sine area under the curve. This is a function which is an antiderivative of our original function. Now, of course, the fact that they have the same symbol is not a coincidence. It's because they're very closely related. This is the, this is the essence of the fundamental theorem of calculus, which is super, super important, and that will be the subject of the next video. All right, but for now, let me just calculate a few uh, indefinite integrals and see how that goes. So if I ask you to calculate the integral of x cubed dx, so what you asked here is to find the general antiderivative of the function x cubed. So coming back to the table on the second slide, you'll see that this is just x4 over 4 plus the constant 
Indeed, if I take the derivative of this, I'll recover x cubed. So that brings me to a kind of nice trick. Whenever you're asked to find a indefinite integral or antiderivative, you can always check your answer. All you need to do is to differentiate your answer. Your answer. Because by definition, you know that your answer should be such that its derivative should recover the original function. So if you differentiate your answer and you do not recover the original function, that means that your answer is wrong. So you should always do that. Always make sure that you have the right answer. Other important thing is do not forget the constant. This is very important here. This constant, we call it constant of integration, is actually very important because this stands for the general antiderivative. So you need to have this arbitrary constant here. Okay, so let me give you two more examples. So suppose that I give you, ask you to integrate the following function. Now, in the next few weeks, we'll see lots of uh, techniques on how to perform these integrals. Right now, we haven't seen any techniques. So all we can do is really guess the answer, so use our knowledge of the rules for differentiation to guess what function is such that its derivative gives you back the uh, function in the integral. So this looks like a complicated function, but if I rewrite it, so I'm just going to divide by t to the 3 half, and I'll get this for my function, then it looks a little bit easier. I can use the table in the second slide to find a function such as derivative of this. And you can convince yourself that if you write the following function, let's see, so that should be 1 over minus 1 half t to the minus 1 half plus a constant. So this function is such that its derivative recovers the original function. Take the derivative, here you get the 1 half will cancel, and you get t to the minus 1 half. Here the minus 1 half will cancel, and you get t to the minus 3 half. And you could simplify this answer and rewrite it as false. Right, so that would be the general antiderivative of your original function. All right, so let me give you one last example involving trig function. Suppose that I ask you to find the general antiderivative or the indefinite integral of cosine of 2x. So you're trying to find a function such that its derivative gives you back cosine of 2x. Well, you know that to get a cosine, you need to have a sine. And to get the argument to be 2x, you can guess that you should have your original function to be sine of 2x. But that's not quite right. If you apply the derivative here, yes, you'll get cosine of 2x, but by the chain rule, you're also going to get a 2 in front. So you should have a 1 over half, 1 over 2, to cancel the 2 here. And don't forget the constant. Now, if you calculate the derivative of that, indeed, you recover cosine of 2x. So this is the general antiderivative of cosine of 2x.